is Your Life, an American television tradition. And now, here he is, Mr. This Is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Those of you who were watching This Is Your Life last week saw us do something we've never done before. We pulled a double surprise. At the end of the Johnny Grant story, which you saw last week, we surprised one of the participants in his life, famous movie star and glamour girl, Jane Mansfield. You saw it just up to the surprise where I said, next week, Jane Mansfield, this is your life. But we kept one camera rolling so that you could see tonight the surprise, Jane's reaction, the reaction of Bob Hope, Johnny Grant, and all the others, the bedlam, the confusion, as the stagehands came in to uh, ready the stage for Jane Mansfield's life, which we did a few minutes later before the same studio audience. Now, here's what happened right here on this stage one week ago. Watch. Well, tonight, this is your life, Jane Mansfield. <laughs> this is your life. Come on, Jane, it's your life. We're going to relive in just a few moments, and uh, we'll all see it a week from tonight. Now, Johnny Grant, good night to you, Johnny. Thank you very much. I don't mean that we're pushing you out while the body is still warm. Bob, did you think it might be you? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> You bring in the scenery. Take away the Johnny Grant scenery. Let down the Jane Mansfield scenery. Now, Jane, will you come with me to our chair of honor, so recently occupied by your very good Johnny Grant. You help her over here. By Johnny Grant, where in just a moment we'll unfold the wonderful story of your meteoric rise to stardom. And now here they are. Your This Is Your Life host, Ralph Edwards, and his glamorous guest, Jane Mansfield. Here we go again, Jim. Thank you, Bob Warren. Oh, how do you feel? I, I just really can't talk. I can't. We, I just. Uh, <laughs> we just shoot poor old Johnny off here, you know, and uh, oh, brought you on. His so was a marvelous sweet. life, and yours is, is really going to be wonderful. Oh. We have a lot to tell about Jane Mansfield, who, in the space of seven short years, has leaped from total obscurity to one of the most publicized movie stars of the present day. <laughs> Seldom since the halcyon days of the silent screen has there been a motion picture personality whose publicity has so blanketed the world. <laughs> I remember that golden age of Hollywood, Ralph, and Jane Mansfield is a modern day image of that kind of glamour and ballyhoo. This is the voice of authority on Hollywood, past and present, currently syndicated on 267 radio stations in the United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, and Australia. Jimmy Fiddler in Hollywood. Oh! Hello, Jimmy. Wonderful. Oh, really Why do you compare Jane Mansfield with the glamour gals of yesteryear, Jimmy? Not glamour gals. They were the glamorous ladies of the silent screen. Gloria Swanson, Carol Lombard, Greta Garbo, even the sex girls, uh, Clara Bow and Jean Harlow. Mm -hmm. You know, they lived in a world apart. They lived in a world of dazzle and razzle-dazzle and glitter. They rode around Hollywood in their Rolls Royce limousines and they had chauffeurs and uh, sometimes footmen in smart costumes, smart uniforms. Well, they dined and they played at the old Garden of Valor. They danced under the stars in the grand ballroom of the Hotel Hollywood. Uh, believe me, those were the wonderful days, but they have passed on, Ralph. They have passed on, that is, uh, until they've been revived in the person of Jane Mansfield and her way of living. Oh, yes. thank you, Jimmy. Oh. We have but to look at Jane to see what you mean, Jimmy. By glamour, as to her way of life, we'll watch that unfold during the next half hour. Thank you, Jimmy Fiddler, for painting the picture of old Hollywood. Ralph, well, it was indeed a pleasure, indeed a pleasure. And Jane, continued good luck to you. And I do mean you. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, there it is, Jane. There it is. My home. The house you live in, a cozy 20-room cottage <laughs> with 13 baths nestled on five acres of ground surrounded by gardens, swimming pool, waterfalls, your own private shrine. Why do you live like this, Jane? Oh, we just, we, we call it home. We have quite a few children, you know. Yes. Uh, and you feel, too, I believe, that maybe a movie star could live this oh, way? Oh, I do. I think that, uh, I think everyone should live like he wants to live, and no matter how small it is or how big it is. Right. Your, your life is a waking dream where you live in a make-believe world created for you largely through your own efforts. So. Thank you. Let's go back and, uh, 
see how it all began. I better sit down. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> April 19th. Uh, 1933, the infant Vera Jane Palmer first sees light of day at the respectable hour of 9.07 in the morning oh. at the Bryn Mawr Hospital, Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. You know things I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know why you were around and I wasn't. Eh? You're baptized in the Methodist Church the following June. You're a happy baby, and when you first begin to talk, you name your favorite doll Maury Tory. Yes. Now, uh, what uh, did that mean? That Jane? was a big rag doll. I, I, she was wonderful. She was my dearest friend. I didn't have any brothers or sisters, and that was my, my friend, Maury Tory. Did it she come from Mary Mary Quite Contrary or something like that? We couldn't quite uh, get the source of that, but... Uh, I, I don't know where it came from, but... Uh, well, anyhow, in 1936, your father... A prominent attorney dies, leaving you an only child, and your mother, who goes back to her profession as school teacher in the fall of that year. Vera Jane and I had the best times together, Ralph. Yes, you recognize the voice of your mother, of course. Yeah. Now, Mrs. Harry L. Pierce of Dallas, Texas. Here she is with your stepfather, Mr. Pierce. <laughs> Oh, that. Doggone it, Johnny Grant got my handkerchief, and I know. <laughs> uh, when did uh, Jane first begin to dream of being a movie star, Mrs. Pierce? <laughs> Have you got a handkerchief on you, Mr. Pierce? Johnny Grant got mine, and I. Uh... Uh. Oh, Axel Grunberg, you got one. Someone run one down, will you? Because Bob Warren, you have one. Thank you very much. Oh, no. I just wrote her letter this afternoon. Oh, you've got one already. Now, how do you like that? Oh, I'll dear. keep this, Bob. I, Mrs. Pears, uh, when did you first begin to dream uh, of uh, Janie's being a movie star? When did she begin? Well, when Janie was a little girl, six or seven years old, Ralph, her idol was Shirley Temple. And we used to sing, on the good ship, <laughs> lollipop. Yep. That's I right. shielded her from every unpleasantness uh -huh. and built a sort of pink lollipop world for her. <laughs> As she grew older, she acquired pictures of actresses and plastered her room with them, didn't she, Mr. Pierce? Yes, she used to sit in the middle of a big bed and surrounded with pillows and make believe she was a movie star. Well, uh, you, you gave her singing and dancing lessons, and you yourself taught her uh, dramatics, I believe, uh, Ms. Pierce. Right? Yes, I did, Ralph. And then as she grew older, she had piano and violin lessons. And in fact, Philip Williams from SMU taught Janie, and he had hopes of seeing her in Carnegie Hall. She was that gifted. And sometimes uh, she was a little mischievous. Eh? Remember, <laughs> Jane, come, let's come on over here and, and tell us about the time that you entered the uh, soap contest, Janie. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, I could still get arrested, you know. <laughs> oh, I think, that, don't mention the soap company, and I think they'll forgive you. I, I don't know. I always wanted triplets, so I think it was actually more than that of my own, or twins or something, and I read in Ladies Home Journal magazine, <laughs> And they have always one big page of perfume with soap. And it said to each new baby born in this year, I give a, a free cake of soap. And to triplets, or quintuplets, uh, triplets got a whole case. So I wrote in, <laughs> I was, I think, nine years old or something, and I said I had quintuplets. <laughs> oh, well, one morning, a singing postman came with all the soap in the world. I could hardly see him behind the boxes. And, and, and said, are you, are you, uh, this name? I named the twit, the triplet, Jammy, Sammy, and Pammy, I remember. <laughs> oh, it's a good thing I'm not a writer. I would never have been successful. <laughs> and the first thing I knew about it, Ralph, was when all that soap arrived at our house. <laughs> well, Mr. and Mrs. Harry L. Pierce, thank you for coming here from oh. Dallas to be with your daughter tonight. You'll see Jenny a little later. your senior year in high school, Janie, in January 1950, you marry, a marriage which is later dissolved. You graduate in June, and the following November, one of the happiest <laughs> events of your life occurs, right, Jane? Oh, yes. <laughs> I, in November the 8th, I gave birth to a beautiful little daughter, Jane Marie. Yes. Even though you're now a mother, you continue your education where? 
at the University of Texas. What did you do with Jane Marie during that time uh, when you went to classes? I, I put her in a, in a baby buggy and took her to classes with me. And it's we, not we, too uh, hard, really. We talked to, <laughs> we talked to many people who remember seeing you uh, with little Jane yes. Marie in the basket there. You were inseparable. Up, cutting up frogs with one hand and giving her a bottle with the other. <laughs> Where else did you go to school? You know, what other places? SMU. I went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas and also UCLA. Uh, maintaining a, a B average, even earning a grade of A in a philosophy course in logic. That's har that hardly sounds like a girl who's been characterized as a dumb blonde. Well, to be an actress, you need that. <laughs> Jenny Mansfield was no dumb blonde, believe me, Ralph. The voice of a man who knows you very well since you were eight years old, as a matter of fact. Your counselor at... Southern Methodist University, where he's now I head of psychological him. service, Dr. Harold Chapman. Oh, it's the most wonderful thing. Oh, bless your heart. Oh, I'm oh, so sure. thrilled. Jane was a fine student, eh, Dr. Chapman? Oh. Indeed she was, Ralph. Jane was in one of my psychology classes this in here. Mm -hmm. I certainly <laughs> was, and we've been friends even before that, like, yes. like you said, since, since eight, years, eight, of eight years, of years old. Yes, she was a serious-minded, hard-working student. But you knew of her <laughs> ambition, too. Yes, as her counselor, I knew of this uh -huh. long, burning ambition of hers to become a movie star. Uh -huh. She visualized herself then as she is now. Yeah. And Ralph, her dream has really come true. Jenny, oh. you, you set a goal for yourself, honey. And you went after it, and I'm proud of you. Oh, and you have a yeah. warm spot in your heart for Dr. Oh, Chapman, I too. Southern do. Methodist <laughs> University. Jane, you'll be seeing... Uh, uh, Dr. Chapman, later, the party in your honor at the Hollywood Roosevelt oh, Hotel, so where accommodations have been provided for your family and friends. So Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Oh. That's so wonderful, 1953, you and your two-year-old, Jane Marie, set forth to conquer Hollywood. You work at odd jobs, you sell candy in a movie theater. Yes. You uh, pose for pinup, cheesecake photos. Through your own efforts, secure a screen test at Paramount Studios. But nothing happens. Then January 1955, Howard Hughes stages a spectacular premiere of his latest picture in Silver Springs, Florida. Two planes from New York and two from Hollywood, bearing photographers, reporters, stars, and starlets fly to Florida. And you, Jane Mansfield, a complete unknown, are there. She created the biggest explosion since the atom bomb. Your good friend who covered that premiere, veteran Hollywood motion picture cameraman and freelance photographer, oh, Ted Fisher. Wonderful. Here's Ted. Hello, <laughs> Ted. How are you? Oh, oh, you. Ted, what happened uh, down there? Well, I first saw Jane on the plane, <laughs> and she was wearing the tightest fitting dress I ever saw on a woman. Oh, dear. <laughs> As it turned out, all the other cameramen were shooting still cameras. And I was lucky. I was the only photographer there that covered the event in motion pictures. Well, let's look at some of that film, and you tell us about it, Ted. Oh. Over here. Well, by the time we got to Florida, everyone on the plane knew Jane. The next day, the girls were making entrances in bathing suits. There were some stars there, but when Jane made her entrance, boom! All the photographers went to her like bees to honey. But in the next three days, her picture was in every paper and magazine in this country, South America, and in Europe. Thanks yes. to Ted. What color was your bathing suit, Jane? <laughs> it was red. Kind of a lame, wasn't it? A red lame? Yes, red you had two suits, I believe. They were both red. Ah, uh -huh. well, one was a bikini, I think, that yes. you made your second appearance in. Yes. You remember the suits, Ted? Remember them? How could anyone ever forget them? <laughs> I tell you, I, I even borrowed the suits. I didn't well, own a bathing suit. But when I'd we like got to ask from to whom, because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, when we got back to Hollywood, my brother, George Fisher, on his Hollywood TV program, ran the film and interviewed you. And immediately the phone calls came in from Daryl Zanuck, 20th Century Fox, uh, Hal Wallace, and Jack Warner. And Warner Brothers signed you. Yes. Thank you, Ted Fisher. Thank you. Thank you, Ted Fisher. <laughs> Within a matter of days, the unknown little girl from Texas is a big celebrity, complete with agent, press agent, and Warner Brothers contract. You begin to live the... Adult version of your pink lollipop world, <laughs> Jane Mansfield. So far, uh, no one has seen you act, but they're in for a big surprise there. Hollywood, 1955, Jane. You're perhaps the most photographed, most publicized celebrity of the day. But 
you're still not a star, as you quickly learn when after three small parts and pictures, you ask for a release from your contract. Your agent sends you to Philadelphia to make a picture and then to New York to read for George Axelrod and uh, Julie Stein, who are producing the Broadway play Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter. Uh, what happens, Jane? I got the part. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, didn't Mr. Axelrod uh, coach you how to read for Mr. Stein? Mr. Oh, yes, it was wonderful. He, George Axelrod told me, he said, when you wake up tomorrow morning, that's when, after we open, he said, you look in the mirror and you'll see a star. And I, I kept asking him, I said, are you sure? Because <laughs> otherwise I don't want to wake up. And he kept telling me and telling me and telling me. And uh, he, he was a very good friend of mine. He was, and Julie Stein. He, he yes. was, oh, I, I owe Julie. He gave me my break. On October 13th, 1955, the play opens at the Blasco Theater and runs for 444 performances. Jane was perfect in the part of Rita Marlowe, Ralph. A woman who knew you more intimately than anyone during the run of the play. No. We knew you would rather see her than just anyone Rose. almost. Your wardrobe mistress, oh. Rose Colley. Oh, Rose, God love you. Oh, I'm so <laughs> thrilled. So hard. Oh. It's typical of Jane to want to be friends with everybody. Oh, there. she it was... was such a dear friend. Well, it, it was your first uh, Broadway appearance, uh, Jane. Isn't that right, uh, Mrs. Colley? Yes. And Jane hasn't a nerve in her, Ralph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I remember the opening night when everyone was so nervously pacing back and forth. Jane was sitting in the dressing room pasting pictures in her scrapbook. Oh, dear. <laughs> and it was her turn to go on stage, and she said, couldn't I paste just one more? You, you didn't have stage fright, Jane. Well, I always had all my pets with me. You see, I had a lot of animals. As Rose will tell you. Yes. <laughs> Rose will well, she tell was you. a hard worker, Ralph. <laughs> and uh, was always rehearsing her lines and was working very hard, but was never temperamental. Oh, thank you, thank you, Rose Colley, for thank coming you. from New York to be with thank Jane tonight. <laughs> Thanks. Catching the plane, oh, going right back oh, to work tonight. I'm so happy. Well, the reviews you receive are excellent, Jane. The press exploits your natural endowment. You become Miss Negligee, Miss Tomato, <laughs> Miss Lobster, Miss Direct Mail. Your uh, ex-press agent, Jim Byron, estimates that during the run of the play, your picture appears in newspapers and magazines more than 36,000 times. You're the toast of Broadway, but you haven't reached your goal, Hollywood stardom. The publicity is working, though. 20th Century Fox wants you. The late Buddy Adler buys the play in order to bring you to Hollywood, where you begin a seven-year contract at a four-figure salary. A far cry from the unknown but determined little girl who came to Hollywood only three years before. You immediately go into the picture, The Girl Can't Help It, with Tom Ewell and Edmund O'Brien. You're on target now and traveling at a terrific tempo, Jane. She always finds time to be the, uh, the greatest mother, Mr. Edwards. The voice oh. of one who should know your 10-year-old daughter, Jane Marie. Oh, I know, my love. I know, sweet. Oh, my sweet baby. I Janie, know sweet do you remember your first day in school, honey? I sure do. Mother had a report to the studio that day, but she was late because she took me to, to my school first. She met my teacher and I got enrolled. Yeah. Uh, with your mother so busy, uh, are you able to spend much time with her? I, yes, I do. Um, when she was in the, um, in the picture, the, um, the play on the Broadway, play on uh -huh. Broadway well, successful rock hunter, mm -hmm. she called me every night and sang me my lullaby. Before you went to bed. Well, uh, you two have always been inseparable, so you should be together. So please sit My here. Buddy. I know she's your buddy, Janie. She's going to be with you there tonight. And we're going to go on with your story. Okay, Jane Marie? Okay. By 1956, you're on your way. At least one reviewer feels you're making progress. As an actress reviewing your latest picture in 1957, The Wayward uh, Bus, uh, Ruth Waterbury writes in the Los Angeles Examiner, among the bus passengers, the most touching is Jane Mansfield. As an actress, she should be considered something more than a phenomenon of nature. If ever she gets a role that doesn't use her body first, but lets her ability and personality shine through, there'll be uh, some box office records smashed. But generally speaking, the press still sees you as a pinup girl. In January of 1958, you take one of the most important steps in your life, Jane. What was that, January 58? Oh, my, my wonderful husband. <laughs> the six foot Two inch, 215 pound former Mr. Universe, Miklas Hargitay. Oh. Here's Mickey. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mickey, tell us about the wedding. <laughs> well, he's a wonderful guy. He's been working right I with know, us here I'm and watching this. <laughs> 
Since I know I'm married to him. Well, of course. Uh, if I may break this down, uh, it was planned to be a, a simple wedding at the beautiful uh, Wafer Chapel in Palos Verdes, Portuguese band. Mm -hmm. We send out 100 invitations, pink invitations. <laughs> yes, well, pink is uh, Jane's favorite color. It sure is. <laughs> and thousands of fans showed up, really, and I saw no one but Janie. <laughs> Next morning, when I picked up a newspaper, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> you didn't know all those people were there? I what? didn't see no You were just riding around on a pink cloud uh, there, Mickey. <laughs> sit right here beside Jane. Jane, oh, you Mickey. sit by Janie, and uh, oh. you sit right there, Mickey. <laughs> Thank you. December 21st, 1958. Now, December 21st, 1958, that's an important day in your life. Oh, the birth of my, my first son. At St. Yes. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, and on August 1st of this year, your second son, Zoltan Anthony, is yes. born at the same hospital, where the uh, nurses tell us you're the nicest star patient they've ever had. In oh. fact, there's a group of nurses from uh, St. John's Hospital in the audience here watching right now. Oh, See, there they are. Wonderful. They told us you were no trouble, oh. always kind and considerate, and you can come back any time, they said. I'll be back soon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jimmy, maybe we got a scoop. <laughs> I've always found Jane completely natural, simple and sweet. Quite a contrast to the picture she presents to her public. A very dear friend of yours, Jane, the Associate Rector of All Saints Church in Beverly Hills, California, Dr. Kermit Castellanos, better oh, known to his parishioners as Casey. Casey. Here's Casey. Oh, Casey, how wonderful. Thank you, Casey. Thank it you is wonderful very to be much. here. Oh. Well, Casey, uh, my dear friend, good to see you. <laughs> Casey and I are buddies in Beverly That's Hills. Just uh, wonderful. How well do you know Jane, Casey? Well, I know her pretty well. <laughs> and, uh, I know her daughter, too. Jane Marie's a good friend of mine. Yes, she is. Miss Mansfield <laughs> comes to church, and Jane Marie comes to church school and sings in our children's choir and is active in a good many things there. Her mother always sees that she gets there, and if she can't bring her herself, why, she sometimes gets one of the neighbors to bring her. <laughs> and quite often, I've driven Jane Marie home from church. Sounds as uh, <laughs> normal as apple pie. <laughs> yes. Yes, I've always found Jane very normal and natural and human. Very lovely. Oh, it's wonderful you. to see her at home, too, with her babies. Well, perhaps that can be arranged. Could we have the babies, please? Oh. Here we are. Nicholas Jeffrey. He's a big boy, two years old. Uh, Mickey, you hold Nicholas. There we go. Because we have Zoltan Anthony. Zoltan Just for a month, if Grandma will relinquish him, we'll give Zoltan to uh, Mickey, I guess. Or, or give uh, Mickey to Mickey and Zoltan. Zoltan to Mickey. I don't know. But anyhow, there you are. Uh, you hold him. A family portrait that your fans seldom see, <laughs> Just don't throw him. Uh, <laughs> you know, Mr. Universe here, he's so strong, he bounces him around. He's so sweet. Mommy's got her hands full. They all want to go to Mommy here. Well, Jane Mansfield, you've come a long way from the pink lollipop world your mother created for you, where you could dream of someday being a movie star. Your two latest pictures haven't yet been released. It happened in Athens, made in Greece, and uh, The Loves of Hercules, in which your husband Mickey here plays Hercules. Many of the outstanding events in your life are depicted on this gold charm bracelet, created and provided for you by Marshall Jewelers. Bob Warren, do we have the charm bracelet? Thank you. Marshall Jewelers, Fifth Avenue, New York, presents that to you. And so that you can relive this night, we have a film of tonight's program for you, along with this Bell and Howell sound motion picture projector to show it on in the 16-millimeter electric eye movie camera furnished by the Bell and Howell Company. Now, in an effort to combat juvenile delinquency, uh, Mickey teaches classes in weightlifting at the Eastside uh, Boys Club, and you, Jane, take an active part in all the activities of the club. So, in the spirit of the Christmas season, the Mars uh, Candy Company is providing a selection of thousands of wonderful Mars candy bars, and uh, also in your name, the fine folks at Mars Candy Company want the Eastside Boys Club of America to have this check for fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, the boys down there. Oh. We see you now, Jane Mansfield, with your baby in your arms, surrounded by your family and loved ones, a devoted wife and loving mother. This side of Jane Mansfield is not exploited by the press. It's not exciting, not good copy. But the glamorous celebrity is. You've created yourself in the image of the most publicized queens of the silver screen. These are the two sides of Jane Mansfield, and this is your life. Good night. God bless you. Oh, thank you. Travel arrangements for guests on This Is Your Life are provided by TWA, Transworld Airlines, who fly the super jets. You fly the finest when you fly TWA, the super jet airline.
This is Your Life is a Ralph Edwards production produced by Axel Gruenberg and directed by Richard Gottlieb.